What's up, everybody? Welcome to episode number 80 of the Ridge Hunter Outdoors podcast on this beautiful Memorial Day. I apologize for it being a little bit delayed, but we had Austin Stone in studio today. He was nice enough to stop by. He's in the middle of his whitetail slam, scouting for that for this upcoming fall. We did get to talk about that with him. We got to talk about a lot of public land stuff, a lot of private land stuff. We talked about scrape hunting. We talked about running trail cameras, entry and exit. We got into a ton of good stuff today on this episode. I think it's a really good one. I think you guys are going to enjoy it. But before we get into that, don't forget to support the podcast by checking out our sponsors. Grandpa Ray Outdoors specializes in providing the best nutrition for whitetail deer on your property, starting with the soil. They offer a full line of high-quality food plot seed and plant foods. They were started in 2015, but John's been in the business since 1991. They've got over 14 different food plot blends to choose from, so you're not going to have any trouble finding what you're looking for, whether that be fall or spring blends, grains, liquid fertilizer, soil test kits, switch grasses, you name it, they've pretty much got it. They're not just about selling their products, though. They're going to answer any questions you have about what would be best for your specific property. That way you can achieve the best results possible. They're not about a fancy label or package either. They're about good quality seed and taking care of their clients. John doesn't believe in a cookie-cutter approach to this stuff either. He's going to treat you and your situation individually, so he's not going to tell you the same thing he would somebody else in a completely different situation. We've used their seed on countless client properties all over the Midwest, out as far west as Kansas, as far east as east, the eastern part of Kentucky, south to Tennessee, north to northern Illinois. Uh, the results have always been as good as advertised, and obviously we use it on our own properties as well for that reason. That's why we started partnering with them in the first place, because they do have such a good product, and it's it's a legit seed. And you're not getting a lot of filler. The germination rate's great on it. That's why we why, that's why I wanted to work with them on the podcast. So if you guys want to check them out, go to GrandpaRayOutdoors.com and use discount code RHO podcast, that's all lowercase, no space, and you'll get 5% off your order, and that'll show them that we sent you there and help us out as well. So help us out, help your deer herd out, and get more bang for your buck when it comes to your seed. Another way you guys can support is to check out what Rodney Hawkins has going on at RG Outdoors. He's currently carrying hard and soft-sided blinds and blind chairs, all from Radix Blinds. He's also got an all-natural scent elimination product called Camo Dust. He's got Tacticam trail cameras now. And he's got burner self-defense weapons. Anything that he has going on there, you can find on his Facebook page, RG Outdoors. You can email him any questions, rgoutdoors at yahoo.com, or just call him directly at 618-925-3153. Make sure you tell him that we sent you over there. He's also a land specialist with Midwest Farm and Land. If you guys haven't heard of them, they're not really your average real estate company. They sold over $85 million worth of ground in 2022. They've got agents like Rodney all over Illinois, so they're really a local company with a national reach. If you want to get a piece of ground listed that you own, if you're looking to buy something, if you're just kind of filling out the market and want to know what's out there, what's available, or what might be coming up available, again, call Rodney directly at 618-925-3153. Don't forget about our social media. It's Ridge Hunter Outdoors, Facebook and Instagram. Those are the ones we use the most. And, of course, the YouTube channel, Ridge Hunter Outdoors. Make sure you subscribe to that, like, and comment on any of the videos. We also have a Facebook group now that's RHO Podcast Patrons. For you guys that listen to the podcast a lot, that way you can get some exclusive content and uh, we have the opportunity to ask questions to the guests that we have coming up. Anything like that you'll find in that group. Again, that's RHO Podcast Patrons. RichHunterOutdoors.com, that's our website. Anything you find on there that you like, use the discount code RHOPOD. That's all caps, no space, and you get 10% off anything on there, whether that be our scents, whether that be apparel, our food plot seed, anything you find on the website, use that discount code. You can follow us on Apple Podcasts and Spotify as well. Leave us a review on there. That helps us out. Those are all ways you guys can support the podcast. We'd appreciate you doing any of that stuff. And, of course, supporting our sponsors at the same time. We couldn't do this without them. So... Without further ado, we'll get into the episode today. Like I said, we had Austin in studio, so it was a really good conversation with him. We got into a lot of good stuff. I think you guys are going to enjoy it. Hopefully, you'll learn something from it, maybe take something into this fall. We're looking forward to seeing what he has coming up this fall. What um, We talked about his whitetail slam that he's going to do, wishing him the best of luck on that. And we'll have him in again sometime, uh, probably before then or during the season, just depending on what his schedule looks like, and we'll get to talk about where he's at with all that. But you guys can keep up with him on his YouTube channel, Tactical Approach Outdoors. He's got a lot of good videos already up, and he's posting videos of his scouting ventures while he's out there getting ready for 
this upcoming season. So, let's get into episode number 80 with Austin Stone. This is the Rich Hunter Outdoors podcast. Hey everybody, we got Austin Stone from Tactical Approach Outdoors in studio this time. We had him on three, four weeks ago now. Uh, it's been a little bit now. It's been a little while yeah. now. We got yeah. Nate here too. I'm Canyon. So, man, you're just getting back off the road. Well, you're still on the road. You just got off the road this morning for a little bit to come record with us from Kentucky. I know you've done a lot of walking down there, set up a bunch of cameras. How'd it go this weekend? It went pretty good, man. Two full days out mm-hmm. there and um, really covered this property pretty good. I already had a few years of intel gathered on this property, so I feel pretty confident about it, mm-hmm. at least in the direction I'm going. So this is kind of, you know, I said a few historical cameras that I know produce, you know, good bucks and, and then find some other spots that are little fill-in-the-blank mm-hmm. locations after that. So, I mean, I, I loaded it down with 15 cameras this weekend. Yeah. So, like you said, you're, you've are you hunted here before, so you got at least a little bit of an idea to start. How much does that save your time from, like, just a, a new property that you're hunting? It streamlines it substantially. Because yeah. what I was able to do on Saturday is I actually completely set all of my primary cameras on Saturday. So I was done. Mm -hmm. in one day and i said i think i said 11 cameras that that day so i had two main ridge systems that i wanted to cover really well and um i already knew that those ridge systems not only produced you know a good buck but it produced multiple good bucks Mm -hmm. and on a regular basis during daylight so um, i had a really good feel about those ridge systems already so i was like okay let's go right to them put the cameras that in location, the same locations that I know I've been producing deer and getting intel. Mm-hmm. And then I've got a few locations I'm curious about. You know, a, a creek crossing, uh, another little ditch, you know, further down. Uh, and then bump it over to a, a completely different side of the ridge where it might be an overlooked right. draw and point there. So I'm curious about a couple locations, see if I can put together a few more of those puzzle pieces Mm -hmm. and add on to the intel I already have in those locations. So how did you decide to break up? Because I know we talked the other day. You Mm had, I don't know, eight or nine uh, cell cams, and then the rest of them were traditional, regular cameras. How did you decide to break those up? Did you put the cell cameras in the new spots or the ones that you knew produced, or how did you decide to break it up? A little bit of both. A little bit of so, both. So um, th- there's a few locations I don't have service in, so I got to put. Yeah. Um, It'd be a waste to put a cell camera there. Yeah, 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 and and it looks like I'm having some service issues already. Yeah. So, but you know, <laughs> y'all know how all that goes. Oh, yeah. So next time I come up, I'm just gonna have to check them. Mm-hmm. But um, I want to put them in locations I know are producing deer on a regular basis. And then the, there was one or two other places that was really heavy trails, really beat down, good crossing, maybe a little bit more difficult to access. Mm-hmm. And that's where I'm going to put that cell camera. So I'm trying to, the further we get into the summer, the less I can get away with when it comes to intrusion. Mm-hmm. So I'm trying to set cameras, the card pull cameras, where they're somewhat easy to access so I'm not, messing up my hunt before it even begins Mm -hmm. so um that's kind of how i went went about setting up my cells versus my card pull and then we'll just go from there so here in a month or so i'll come back down and see what the cameras are showing adjust as needed and if i need to take this cell cam out and put a regular sd card in that's cool or i'll just put a cell cam in a location that is actually producing more deer. Yeah. So I'll just kind of fill it out as I go throughout the summer. Yeah, that's interesting, too, that uh, since you're hunting so early down there in Kentucky, in your early season, you're going to be on their summer pattern. It it almost becomes more important, even when you're running those summer cameras, to have less intrusion. Because, like, for us, we're hunting them in October. That's early as we can hunt them. And a lot of times, you know, 
me and him, I know for sure, won't go out even till maybe the second week, October 3rd. Yeah, because that, that first week, uh, even even the first two weeks, sometimes it's like uh, you still got a few bucks on their summer pattern, and then some of the others are changed, and everything's mm-hmm. different than it was. You know, that, there's yeah. a lot of change happening right there. Yeah, so just depending on weather and time constraints and all that, we may not even go till the second, third week, October. Yeah. But where you're going in September to hunt them for sure on their summer patterns, you really don't want to bump them off those good and checking the cameras. Yeah, because the deer aren't moving very far right? as it is. So the last thing you want to do is take a location where they feel safe and they're predictable mm-hmm. and then make them unpredictable. Right. That's mm-hmm. the that's the last thing you want to do. So it's so ca- you need to be so careful about how you go about, you know, accessing these areas, using the ditches with the rocks as much as possible to mm-hmm. keep your, your scent down mm-hmm. and noise down. Um Use, you know, as the crops grow, the field edges are going to become a little bit tricky to access Mm because those deer are going to use the crops for cover. So they're Mm going to hold into those fields and on the field edges more. So you can't really use the field edge as an easy access really anymore either. So it's the ditches. There's some logging roads. Use as much as that as I possibly can to try to keep my intrusion down. And obviously, the the closer I get to season, the more perfect I'm to be with my scent control, or as perfect as yeah. I can get. Yeah. And then it'll be kind of a maybe pick a windy day and um, just do my best. With traveling like I do, it's not like I can just, hey, hey, it's going to be a bad weather day. Let's go do it. Right. I just kind of got to take what I'm given here. But... You just do your best with your intrusion. Go in the middle of the day. It's hot, but that's when the deer are moving the least. Mm-hmm. And yeah. just, just kind of do your best. In ways that's similar to your entry and access into your stands. 100%. And, and I think we talk about a lot that that gets overlooked, I think, quite a bit, mm-hmm. let alone checking your trail cameras and being careful about that. And that's a good point that you bring up because that's part of the trick with, with hunting that early. Because the bucks are not moving very far, you need to be set up on top of them. Mm-hmm. And the and most of the time, the buck is already in his bed before daylight. Yeah. So it's like you can't just go in there like you can in October. Mm-hmm. Get get in there really deep into the bed, and he's going to show up mid-morning. And catch him on his way back. And you're going right? to catch yeah. him on his way back. The buck's already there mm-hmm. before daylight. Right. So most of the time anyways, right? So so you can't really beat him back to that location. And mm-hmm. if you are, your 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 access, that time your timing in your access is the same timing as his. Mm-hmm. So the opportunity of bumping that deer significantly goes up when you're accessing in the morning. So you gotta be very careful with that morning hunt, which means most of the time you're coming in after he's bedded down mm-hmm. and you just gotta get in as close and as tight to him as possible and pick a known route out of his bed you know what i mean pick, yep. pick a, a draw or a creek crossing that he's going to be using the wind and you just try to cheat that wind as best you can so but same idea with the trail cameras you access it the same way you know because i, I want to know is like okay i can access here and not bump that deer out and then i'm and right. out and yep. i'm good to go and i'm clean yep so we Talking about being in Kentucky, this is all part of your whitetail slam that you're doing this upcoming season, which you've started the series on YouTube. What gave you the idea to do that? Why did you uh, kind of pick the states that you did for it? And like, just tell us about it a little bit, I guess. So um, the whitetail slam kind of got me excited. I'm I'm kind of a goal oriented guy and i and i love a challenge mm-hmm. <laughs> so you definitely got so, that <laughs> right yeah no kidding so i i saw the slam and i'm like i, I want to hunt some different states and i kind of want to bring in a little bit of a a wow factor of sorts to ma- maybe the the show and really produce a lot of content for for hunting mm-hmm. you know um we, we only have a couple cameras that run throughout the season so we when you look at other channels that have 10 guys running right. cameras they're producing a lot of content mm-hmm. where when you have one or two cameras running on a weekend you're significantly yeah. limited on that so i'm like yep. okay how, how can i bring in a lot of content and then also you know i'm going to be hunting so many different types of terrain yeah you know going into north dakota kentucky 
um, Missouri, Kansas, and Illinois. A lot of those are going to be very similar because they're pretty close in proximity, Mm -hmm. but also very different at the same time. And then you've got Kentucky with a September 2nd opener. Mm -hmm. And then um, I haven't even scouted North Dakota because it's a further distance for me. So that's going to be a complete freelance hunt. So there's a few really cool challenges that uh, I'm bringing into this season. The mm-hmm. The only properties that I truly have um, history with are um, Kentucky and my Missouri properties. Mm-hmm. This, this Kansas property is a new property to me. So I've scouted it significantly over the um, postseason, and mm-hmm. there's a few videos on there from that. But other than that, I haven't actually hunted this pro- property. So most of this season is going to be either new properties or new states in general. Right. So um, I wanted to, knowing it was going to be that significant amount of hunting, a lot of travel, I tried to pick states that were in each re- region mm-hmm. but close proximity to me when it comes to travel distance. Yeah. So, um, you know, Illinois and Kentucky are a decent travel distance for me, but they're not bad. Mm-hmm. They're kind of around the edges of that. It's not Ohio. Exactly, <laughs> yeah. right? Exactly. Yeah. And then no- North Dakota, the only way I could have got closer in that particular region um, would have been maybe to hunt, well, Minnesota would have been about the same drive. Maybe a northern South Dakota mm-hmm. hunt. But um, I like the looks of some properties in North Dakota, and I was like, I haven't hunted there yet, so. Yeah, let's do it. Well, yeah. So, what's your? Obviously, the goal is to kill a buck in every state. That's the goal. But what would you? What would you consider successful for your, for this, uh, adventure? Killing a buck in every state, or is it getting on bucks in every state? I mean, getting on bucks in every state. You you know, like I I always look at a tag as an opportunity. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm. It's if I fill it, great. If I don't. I had fun and I learned a lot doing it. You know, if we, I think we get too caught up and we have to fill a tag, have to fill a tag. But if you really want to shoot big, mature deer on public land, you have to be okay with eating tag soup. If you are not okay with eating tag soup, you need to lower your expectations because it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. There's too many uncontrollables and those deer are awfully smart. Yeah. <clears throat> so we, we eat tags on private land, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, it's that they're smart, man. Yeah. And yeah. so, so expecting to kill for my ultimate goal is four bucks. Okay. Right. That yeah. that's my ultimate goal. And right. it's, it's either, um, Missouri, Kansas, they're in the same region. Mm-hmm. And then you've got one in the other three States. That's my ultimate goal. If I hit, if I shoot, five and and put a tag on in all five states would be insane right but if i shoot one or two bucks i'm cool yeah you know you know what i mean yep. and and if i'm if i shoot one or two bucks and i am on bucks in all the other states that's a success to me man mm-hmm. so like that's i'm perfectly cool with that the we'll see if i can accomplish it but we'll right that's a success to me <clears throat> yeah cool uh, what's your timeline? I believe you're starting in Kentucky mm-hmm. in September. Uh, what's timeline after that? Do you know yet? You know, that's where I start making it up. Yeah. <laughs> so, so about the only set hunt is probably, um, North Dakota, which I'll probably hit at the end of October. Mm-hmm. And the reasoning, is that their rut? Yeah, okay. and, and the reasoning behind that is because I want to hit more rut movement, mm-hmm. and it's because I'm freelance hunting. So yeah. it's like I need a, I need something on on my side to help me out a little bit with that. Yeah, mm-hmm. and then Illinois, um, I'm gonna start running cameras in Illinois. You know that late August September time, and um, if I've got some good activity, I might come down here for an opening day. Right. Mm-hmm. Hunt. So we'll, we'll kind of just fill it out. Um, Kansas opens September 12th or 13th. Oh, wow. I They're think. Earlier than I thought. Yeah. Yeah. So I like, if I'm on deer, I'm going to hunt. Mm-hmm. You, you know what I mean? So that that's where 
the um, really the only two set hunts probably are Kentucky and North Dakota when it comes to timing. And then after that, I'm just, I'm working. I'm scouting, and if I can run trail cameras, I'm running trail cameras. Not all these properties I can run trail cameras on. Right. So I just kind of got to make it up as I go and just and just hunt. And whatever's fresh, I'm hunting it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So if even if if this state's not fresh yet, but this state is, I'm coming over here. <laughs> yeah. you, you know what I mean? Yep. So that that's kind of how the October, November time frame is going to work out it's going to be a lot of bouncing and a lot of just adjusting to the fresh sign because the rut really doesn't hit hard till closer to november mm-hmm. anyways so i love hunting those first scrapes though yeah mm-hmm. that's a that's a dangerous setup on those very first scrapes mm-hmm. so that's what i did in iowa and um missouri uh, in 21 i shot the both of those bucks seven days apart and are on the first open scrapes on the property. Mm-hmm. So that I love that that hunt because it's also predictable. It's that that quote unquote October lull. Those first open scrapes, very predictable, just like mm-hmm. a summer pat pattern is. They're not moving as far, mm-hmm. but they're leaving you something. And they're yeah. ta- and they're moving a little bit further. They're wanting to move more more during the day. Mm-hmm. So I love those first open scrape hunts. So when you're talking about scrape hunting, because we talked about this a little bit, uh, are those those first ones are what you're looking for? Is it a location that goes into that too? What all goes into when you walk into the woods and you say, you see a scrape, you say, okay, that's the one I'm hunting. Yep. Why is that the one that you're going to hunt? There's a few factors that go into it. Obviously, you don't hunt every scrape. Right. Most scrapes you're going to walk past. You're going to mark it because it, it goes into the intel and mm-hmm. the pattern gathering. But you're not going to hunt it. I need a scrape that is close proximity to cover and producing mass trees. And the trick there is that you most of the time you won't find a scrape if you don't have those two. Mm-hmm. You need that that's the that's the funny part about about it too. The deer where I talk a lot about this in my videos and stuff is I let the deer tell me where they feel comfortable, and that sounds funny. Until you start reading what they're they're leaving you, mm-hmm. you know what I mean. The the converging sign, the increase in activity, that's where they feel safe. Mm-hmm. So, like, if you really think about it like that, and you keep an open mind, they're gonna tell you where they're at at that moment in time. And you know, you might find some field edge scrapes during that that time, but I honestly haven't found a ton of those usually usually when i find scrapes it's somewhat close proximity to bedding Mm -hmm. and there's always big producing mass trees and of course water's close because water is important you know with um earlier in the year and also with the seasons being a little bit more dry so last year's kansas hunt i was i scouted this property this scrape i ended up killing my buck on this year um actually it was a different Different scrape, but 50 yards apart. So I found this scrape at the beginning of September. This scrape was already open. Mm-hmm. This ridge top had four scrapes already open at the first, second week of September, before opening day, mm-hmm. right? And that's where I ended up focusing my efforts. There's a natural spring close, producing mass trees all on that oak flap. And then that was just below the top third, and that top third, the whole top third was cedar thicket. Mm-hmm. So... You got a lot of great bedding cover. You got producing trees, and you got a spring all within 100 yards. Yeah. I mean, he doesn't have to move at all to hit all of that stuff. Right. And on a south wind, that's where he was. So um, there's a few things that go into what scrapes I hit, and usually the scrapes that are being used – the most you can tell mm-hmm. that they're being pawed out heavy and they're they're a little bit bigger than the other ones. Those are usually all, always going to be closer to each of those factors. You know what I mean? So there's a few things that I take going into that. And I also look for clusters of scrapes. I don't mm-hmm. just look for a singular scrape. I want to find an area that has three to five scrapes in a close proximity because that also means that he's using that or multiple bucks are using it on yeah. a regular basis. Mm-hmm. So I'm trying to overlap home ranges 
also, and that's a lot of times where you're going to find those big community scrapes. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm after right there. You might have one buck use it more often, but you got multiple bucks using it. Yeah. I think a lot of times the guys where they get confused on scrape hunting is you mentioned the field edge scrapes because you'll sit and around here where it's all mostly ag, you can watch one buck make in an evening. He'll walk down a, a, field edge and make three or four scrapes yep and then they never get touched again the rest of the year now like you might get an inside corner or something where it's getting a lot of traffic Mm -hmm. and deer will stop and use it but if it's just a random scrape on a field edge where there was a branch hanging low and he was just feeling frisky for whatever reason that day he could literally make it's kind of the same way with rubs Mm -hmm. he might make three or four on that field edge just because that's what he was feeling that day yep and you could sit there and hunt that thing you're never going to kill a deer on it because he's the only one that's ever done it. You've already missed him. Yeah. So I think that's that's where a lot of guys get hung up on scrape hunting is not hunting the right ones. Mm-hmm. They just see a scrape, Cause, and then cause that's that, where they go for that's it. the first one they saw when they walked on, on the field, and they're like, this is it. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. 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 And they keep keep walking. They, they, they never get intel. down there. They never get down there to the thicket, you know, yep. uh, the ones that he is. The one know, he is using. Potentially using in daylight. 100%. Yeah. E- even if it... it like you said, an inside corner, you know, he could be hitting that during mm-hmm. daylight, but it's further down from that previous scrape and it's right next to that thick stuff. Mm-hmm. So, you know, the chances of him using that during daylight, depending on the property, go down, especially during on public. But, you know, do you mm-hmm. have that opportunity? Yeah. At an evening hunt, at least. For sure. I think that's, you were talking there about, uh, like you go back and you get in tight, when you can and hunt those scrapes on the public ground, I think there's some benefit to being able to do that on public because, or I mean, uh, some necessity, I guess, because you, you have to do that to go find the deer. Whereas like that property we were on the other day that I showed you, there's a spot that's, they'll have scrapes on every year. And it's kind of a ridge that runs the middle of that property. But for me to get back there to it, I'm taking a, really high risk of bumping something off of there yeah and if i bump something off there they're gone like we talked about yep so that's where as a private landowner if you can get close enough and then do something to draw them to you yep with your where that's where your habitat improvements would come into play 100 percent. if you can do them to benefit pulling that deer to you you know make it make it more beneficial for you to be able to hunt it you can do that on private, whereas like what you're talking about on public ground, you kind of have to get back in there just maybe a little more uncomfortable that's, and get closer. That's a very good point because I, in order to harvest that deer, you have to go get them mm-hmm. at that point. I have no choice but to go hunt that ridge. And, and that, in turn, takes me to how I approach that, that ridge. I do a lot of all-day hunts. Mm-hmm. And the biggest major and the biggest reason for that is not actually that I'm expecting all day movement. Is that if I leave that stand and then come back, mm-hmm. I just screwed up my entire hunt. Yep, gone. So I am accessing that ultra early, like s- stupid early mm-hmm. in the morning, and I'm just sitting it hour and a half before daylight. Yep, and and letting and just getting there. Be f- with the lowest opportunity of bumping deer, and, and especially the deer I'm after, and then just sitting it, mm-hmm. and then wait until after dark to leave. You know that just increases your opportunity at not bumping that deer mm-hmm. out, especially if that ridge system is a little distance from a crop field, because it's going to take them a second to get back there from the from their nightly routines, and then by the time evening rolls around, you've had a last thirty minute hunt, right? Mm-hmm. And then after dark, a lot of times they have moved out, and they yeah. haven't. If they haven't already, you just got to do do your best to, you know, get mm-hmm. out of there as quick as you can. Yeah. Aside so, from sleeping in the stand. Aside from sleeping <laughs> in the stand, right? Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So, um, that's another reason I do what I do, and it's not because I expect a lot. Of midday movement it depends on the time of year mm-hmm. and, and the in the setup but you know i've shot a lot of deer from 9 a.m to 4 p.m mm-hmm. so a lot of really good bucks yep so i mean 
they're moving at I, that time too. I tell you, especially during November and late October, 100%. I get a I get a bunch of pictures of mature buck on their feet mm-hmm. from eleven o'clock to two o'clock. I I shot my Candace buck mm-hmm. last year, at right around ten fifty. Mm-hmm. So yeah, yeah. I mean they're, that they're, whole they're, midday they're window, like you said, nine to four. They're moving. Yeah, yeah. It's definitely can be a good time and. That, Overlooked as well, and yep. impatience probably comes into that some because you get out there in the morning at that time of year. You know, it's it's early, yeah, and you're getting out there when the sun's rising. Yeah, and by by eight o'clock, if you're not seeing any deer, I'm getting out of here. Yeah, and and that's a horrible mistake because in reality, some of the locations I'm set are so deep from a crop field mm-hmm. that I'm not a seeing a deer until eight a.m. Mm-hmm. So, so, and then once it, once they show up, they all show up yeah. and then we're, we're in a hunt. Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, it, it, a lot of it, you said, like you said, the impatient side of that, I think that plays a big role in it also. And it's just, you just gotta wait them out. Yep. You just gotta just be patient and wait them out. I think especially on private where if you have your access hammered down where you know you can get in and out, even going in. At like mm-hmm. 10 o'clock. I've done that before. I had yeah. a hunt last year where I was 20 yards from killing a really nice mature buck. Mm-hmm. And I went in, I left the house at like 10, 15. Yeah. And he came by at like 11, 30. Yeah. I mean, he was just about was 20, just far, 20 yards too far in yep. the brush. But I think that's a strategy. Even if maybe you do do that morning hunt and you get tired or whatever mm-hmm. and you go back or maybe you just sleep in and then go out there a little later because yeah. there's a lot of overlooked movement in the middle part of the day, especially during the rut. There is 100%. Yeah. And you were talking about the rut earlier. There's another kind of, it's actually more of a similarity, I guess, on private and public land uh, where you're talking about hunting North Dakota in the rut because you haven't been there before. It's a new property. You're going to up your chances. That's where a lot of times for private landowners and guys that are trying to manage that for deer, if you can manage it to where you're giving yourself a better chance, like from October all the way through the season, you don't just have to wait for that, you know, two week window mm-hmm. or whatever it is in November. Yep. But I think that's where a lot of guys will stick to hunting because you do have a better chance of getting lucky. Yeah. Uh, but that has as much to do with it because the rut's so unpredictable. But if you can go in there and hunt in October and December and maybe January, mm-hmm all the work you've put in gives you a better chance and you've just you've opened your window so much farther and you don't have to just hunt that November time frame and that kind of on public is if you have the opportunity if you have the ability especially guys that are hunting the same public spot year after year they're just hunting their home state like most guys are if you can go in there and put in that work then similar to where if you put in that work on private ground making improvements doing food plots then you've opened your window up where you can hunt opening day all the way through the end of the season and maybe have a better chance yeah, you know, when I'm searching for a property and I'm on a client parcel, I want to find a location and or create a location if it's a client that the deer want to be at. They want to feel it, they feel comfortable, and they want to stay at during the predictable, quote-unquote, harder-to-hunt time of the season. Mm-hmm. If you can create that on your property or locate that on public – that will just get magnified mm-hmm. in the rut. And the only problem you're going to have is once that that chasing phase really begins, they can get unpredictable, and then, f- you know, they could find a doe five miles away mm-hmm. and be there for a week or two, you know. You know? So, yep. so um, but if he's there on your property and you feel safe, you can get him early. The, the faster you are on the trigger on jumping on that, predictable movement Mm -hmm. the better the odds are that you're going to harvest that deer but because i don't have any intel gathered in north dakota i i don't have a specific buck Mm -hmm. i'm hunting that increases my odds of like you said getting lucky right so so that's what i'm that's what i'm trying to do is increase my odds of of lucky and then i just find fresh sign Mm -hmm. and i go from there but on properties that I've got specific deer that I'm kind of after, which doesn't happen a lot, mm-hmm. but it does, and um, that's when I want to be early on the early on the trigger as best I can. Yeah, and and then you know that later November time, if they've met made it 
to that point, then they'll become a little bit more predictable again in their home range, but they're moving still searching for does. Mm -hmm. So it's a great time frame throughout the season. If you can create a property or find a property that they feel safe in Mm -hmm. and they want to stay in has all the resources that they need, then you've got it. You've increased your chances through an ent- the entire season, exactly, and not just relying on those two weeks of random movement. Yeah, that you're going to get a picture of one buck, and then you're never going to see again. Yeah, because he just came through that one time. Yep. When you think about it, if you give yourself three months to hunt versus two weeks, then you're not only increasing your chances of killing a buck that year, but doing it consistently yep. over and over and over. Because if if you just give yourself a two three week window in November. We all know how random it is. Yep. There are typically more mature bucks on their feet in a daylight, yep. but who knows where they're going to be. One might come by. So if you take that four-year window, okay, you get lucky one time. And I say lucky because that's part of what it is. It's part of what and, it is. And if you're not putting a plan together and you're just going out there and, mm-hmm. and saying, well, that tree looks good, then that's really what it is. <laughs> yeah. Um, if you're just planning on getting lucky in the rut, you may do it one time in those four years, mm-hmm. maybe two if you get really lucky. Yep. Now spread out to three months. You've given yourself that much more time. Now you have 12 months over those four years instead of eight weeks to kill four bucks. Yeah, a- absolutely. And then you're learning a lot too. Yeah. You know, you, you're learning about, you're learning a lot more about these deer and how they use the property throughout the season mm-hmm. and the changes in their patterns. And you just, it's it's fun being in the woods also yeah. Yeah. so i like i like sitting in a tree mm-hmm. so and and scouting and learning these deer so i mean that increase you know giving yourself that 3 months to hunt really is is a fun time and that's yeah. where like moving to kentucky for an early se- season hunt i mean that is going to be a brutal hunt Mm-hmm. With the heat and the bugs, and it's just, it's just, <laughs> yep. that's just yeah, yeah. I wouldn't necessarily classify that as my favorite thing in the world, <laughs> right? But, right. but it's going to be a very difficult, challenging hunt, which mm-hmm. I'm excited about. And if I can really learn to get good at hunting those very, very challenging times, it'll open my eyes up to a lot of maybe movement patterns and, and, um, habits that I may not have known previously that I can implement when they're traveling more and when the rut starts to kick in more, I can kind of piece together all that Mm -hmm. knowledge. Mm -hmm. So how do you manage? Cause on private land, we'll, we preach this a lot. If you don't have the right day, just stay out of your best spot. Don't go blow it on a bad day. On a borderline day is not the day for your best stand. So, especially going bouncing from place to place, how do you manage not either burning out a spot or you just picking the best day that you've got in those in that week or whatever it is to hunt that best spot, or you just hunting it regardless because you you don't have the opportunity to hunt there all year? I mean, how are you managing that, or are you worrying about that at all? So, um, obviously, wind comes into play. Yeah. still. Yeah, so wind and fresh sign is is really what when it comes to picking your best days to hunt, I I am a huge cold front believer. Oh yeah. And and I like to stay out of my main locations, right? Until that optimal mm-hmm. day hits, right? And a lot of times the optimal day that brings that north wind, which is the reason that they're in that location anyways. Mm-hmm. So, um on a say a North Dakota hunt, I have to hunt it. You know, you know what I yeah. mean. So I, a lot of times I'll use a bad day to scout. Mm-hmm. I'll, I'll hunt the morning, scout mid. You know, pull my set, scout midday, set another set for the e- evening. You know, I'll just kind of use that bad wet weather day as an intel gathering day versus just sitting in a tree, mm-hmm. right? So that that's how I lot like to use my season. I scout a lot. Because these deer deer will adjust. There's a lot of uncontrollables on public. You know, if a hunter moved in and I didn't know about it, and my deer shifted out, Mm -hmm. right? If that sign dried up, I need to know that sign dried up, and then I need to move to the fresh sign. Because I don't need to waste my time 
on on low probability hunt mm -hmm. because <laughs> something happened. Right. So, um, and the only way I'll know that is if I actually gather that intel. So, I'll just fill it out. I'll fill out the hunt. If it's a property that I have the ability to hunt more often, I am going to stay out of those locations mm -hmm. until optimal days, mm -hmm. right? But if it's a property that um, I've got very limited time and I need to make it happen, I'm going to be calculated, with my, my aggression. I'll try to find figure out where he's at during those bad weather days. And if he's still using that good stand during the bad weather days, heck, I'll yeah. I'll go right. I'll go sit it. So, um like I would use an example here for you. Um my Iowa hunt, okay? I I was out there for 5 days. When I got there the fir first day, I already pre post season scouted. Right. This is, but this is my first trip back to the property. Mm -hmm. I needed to locate what was fresh, and then when I got there, I, I, within about half half a day of that first de day, I located located where I needed to sit. I mean, scrapes the size of a car hood mm -hmm. out there, just freaking massive scrapes, and I bumped a really good buck, not sixty yards from where I ended up placing my tree stand. So right, right when I bumped him, I stopped walking. Mm -hmm. I'm like, ah, I need to. Need to stay back here. the The oaks were producing. That he was bedded right on a CRP field edge. You know, right up next to the ridge. So I, I went over to this scrape, and I set my stand. And actually, I hunted that one stand the whole week, and just let it produce. Mm -hmm. I was seeing deer all day, every day. Had an encounter with a really big thirteen point on day number two. I just never got an opportunity at him. Mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, the I just need to let this one produce because my access was perfect. Mm -hmm. If my access was not good, I wouldn't have been able to do that because right. I would have bumped deer and left too much in disturbance and whatnot. That is something to pay attention to. So because my access was so simple coming in from a canoe, I had a 50-yard walk from the river. Mm -hmm. I mean, I wasn't, I was not leaving any disturbance. So because of that, it allowed me to hunt this stand that often. And the wind was good for me all week. And um, on day five, I had the optimal weather day. Day five, I had that really big cold front roll in, super cold, frosty, perfect morning to hunt. Mm -hmm. And he came in at first light, walk, hitting scrapes down that tree line right to my tree or the tree right next to me where that main scrape was. Mm -hmm. So... Um, I didn't get my optimal day until day number five. Right. But I was seeing deer all, all week mm -hmm. still, and my wind was still good, and my access was perfect. So I wasn't, if I went any deeper, I would have had trouble with access, and I wouldn't be able to hunt it until day number five. Right. Right. So with that trip, I was limited time. Mm -hmm. You just had to do what you had to do, and because of those factors adding up, I was able to hunt that property the entire week right. and still come out of there with a mature deer. Yep. <clears throat> uh, you talked a little bit about um, things shifting when other guys move in on you. The way you're hunting these properties, are you having a lot of guys move in on you? Are you are you running into a lot of other, other hunters? Um, or are you doing stuff differently than most guys? So the biggest difference is that for some reason – in a lot of the places that I'm getting to, other guys are not staying. Mm -hmm. They'll walk through, mm -hmm. but they're not staying. Hmm. And to me, that's crazy. Yeah. But because obviously I'm I'm sitting there and I'm shooting deer out of it. Yeah. But it's it's an odd enough spot, and a lot of times it's an odd enough spot. And if that guy doesn't have a few of those other key features that I have found mm -hmm. that lead to that spot, then he wouldn't know that that's a good spot. Yeah. And, and if, if I was that, if I walked past and I didn't have the, those puzzle pieces at the same time, I wouldn't know that was as good of a spot either mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because a lot of the signs, a lot of times can be very sporadic, but they're spread apart, mm -hmm. but they're heading the same direction. Mm -hmm. That's why you mark those and you put the, those together. So I really think those big mature deer know that. Mm 
Mm-hmm. That's why they don't leave a ton of sign where they li- they feel pressured, but they leave sign where it's important. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I run into guys. I know there's guys hunting around me. You know, they, they might not super be super close proximity, but they kind of are at the yeah. same time. It's just I found this one spot, this one little hole, that for whatever reason the deer feel safer there, mm-hmm. and a lot of it comes down to they can wind a lot easier, and they they know they can escape. Mm-hmm. They, they just know they can survive in that spot, and that's why they're there. So, um, and then if some guy does end up staying, and he and that sign dries up then I just move to my next stand. So that, yeah. that's why I try to piece together a lot of stands and a lot of properties because there's also times where an entire property I have to leave mm-hmm. because it just got hammered, Yeah, right? It just it, the, the guys came in, and they walked through all of the bedding. They bumped out all of the deer. None of the scrapes are fresh that were, that were fresh a week ago. I mean, it's like a ghost town. Yeah. And, and, and at that point I just need to leave. Mm -hmm. I said, I got another property I can go to that I know is pretty fresh. I might have to go do some scouting to find it, but I know the property pretty well. Let's just move to it. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's why I like collecting an inventory of properties and stands. It, Mm -hmm. it just helps me increase my odds of, I'm not putting all my eggs in one basket. Yeah. I've done that in the past and I've gotten burnt and eaten tag soup. Yep. And that's never going to happen again. (laughs) At at least because I wasn't prepared. (laughs) Right, right. Yeah. It's not going to happen because of lack of options. Exactly. Exactly. That that was what you said there about the the sign where a guy might overlook it, but it's really important to mark that Mm -hmm. stuff, is where you you might walk in and you see some sign and then you walk a little bit farther and you don't see anything for a while. Well, then you stumble across maybe one other scrape. And then... Like, well, there's not much here other than this one scrape. So you walk along and you stumble across something else. You can establish that pattern of sign over, like you're talking about, oh, maybe necessarily you don't have the quantity, but you have the quality of sign all in a specific direction. Mm -hmm. And if you go in and mark that on Onyx, you can see all those little pins line up and kind of create a pretty good idea of where they're coming from, where they're going, where they're spending their time, Mm -hmm. as opposed to where you're saying that other guy may just think, well, there's one scrape here. Sure. It looks, it looks kind of fresh, but there's nothing else. So I'm just going to keep walking. Yeah. And then it never registers that this one was on this Ridge. And then Mm -hmm. I went a little farther up this Ridge and there was another one. And then I dropped off this Ridge into the saddle and there was another one. And I went up on the next Ridge and a little farther and found another one. Instead of that registering is okay, something's using this whole ridge system. Yeah. It was just like, well, there's not many deer around here because there's not much sign. I think that was interesting because you don't hear that a lot. Yeah. And so, um, like, I found this one location in Illinois um, this spring while I was up there scouting. Hmm. I found a bed. It was an obvious buck bed. Massive rubs net next to it. Big round circle. You know, cedar tree thicket. There's a scrape not 28 yards away. It was a perfect lo- bedding location. And he, it's a kind of location that he could bed there on multiple wind directions. Mm-hmm. It was just one of those perfect little sat setups. And the cool thing, though, is that there was leading out of that bed towards the crop field. I pieced together four rubs that were rubbed at the exact same intensity and they were the exact same height Mm -hmm. height and size the those rubs were the exact same but that they were there were four rubs in about a 200 yard spacing Mm -hmm. right then i go and i look at the onyx each one of those rubs was on the exact same elevation line going from that bed to the saddle Mm-hmm. which then takes him down into the crop field. So I'm like, ah, it's the backside of this ridge, mm-hmm. right? So he's not, he's staying away from the pressure. He's staying on the backside of that pressure, and he's not even going to be getting to that saddle probably till after dark. Right. And then be, because there's hunting pressure there, mm-hmm. but there's rubs leading into it, right? So, but they're very dispersed mm-hmm. rubs. And then when you put them together and you look on the map, 
they're on the same elevation line. So he's walking that same trail on the backside of the ridge from bed Mm -hmm. to that saddle. So, um, stuff like that. And, and also there's certain properties too. Um, a little bit of sign is significant. Yeah. And then other properties, a lot of sign there, where there's a lot of sign, you need to find the bigger sign. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so like this Kentucky property, there's megas there. All right. There's absolute giants. But I'm not finding those big car hood size scrapes. I'm not finding those big massive trees just shredded mm-hmm. like we do in Iowa and Kansas and Missouri and and play and um, I found them in Illinois too. For whatever reason, they're not aggressive, mm-hmm. aggressively rubbing and aggressively scraping on this property. So a little bit goes a long way mm-hmm. at this particular property. So it's learn what 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 the deer are doing on that property because you could overlook it because on social media you see this car hood size scrape and think that this little three foot scrape doesn't mean anything Mm -hmm. well you're wrong uh 180 is probably using that scrape right so it's just that that's what he that's what that scrape looks like he might not be an overly aggressive deer Mm -hmm. you you know what i mean so so just kind of feel out what each property is doing too and that's part of the fun about scouting each prop property because I'll run into places that are super aggressive sign and then I'll run into places that are not aggressive sign and there's sparse but there's really big deer mm-hmm. there so um, you just kind of got to keep an open mind with it and then um, piece together those those movement patterns yeah and then like if I come to the to the point just like with a little bit of sign I've marked it already so if I don't find sign or it's very sparse, I know that that sign's significant. And now I can pee, I can key in on that right. a little bit more yep. versus overlooking it. Where on those big um, aggressive properties, I'll pass by mm-hmm. the small sign. And then I'll only hit the aggressive sign. So it, you just got to fill out what that property is doing and what the deer is habits are on that property Mm -hmm. i think that's a big thing in hunting in general is property to property it's different deer herd to deer herd Mm -hmm. is different but especially when you get on social media if you take a guy and that's hunting georgia Mm -hmm. south georgia and he's looking at a guy hunting northeast iowa and trying to do the same things that he's doing and and there's some stuff that translates but a lot of it won't the deer are just different the time of year is going to be incredibly different, the the way they're acting, all that stuff, Yep. you know, let alone just property to property. If you're talking, you're looking at social media from a guy almost on the other side of the country, north to south, mm-hmm. th- there's going to be a difference there. Yep. And like you're saying, you got to understand what your deer are doing. You can take what they're doing maybe and learn from it, and there's going to be good stuff in there, but try to try to translate it into – what's going on in your neighborhood. Yeah, and, and also keep your expectations realistic. Mm-hmm. I think a lot lot of guys, especially um, in the harder-to-hunt states, um, I hear, hear, I personally hear, hear it a lot. So the, you think a mature buck is a 180, 170, 180. Well, that's not necessarily the case in all states. A mature buck could be 110, 120, mm-hmm. right? So you pass him thinking that he's a young buck and you claim that there's no mature bucks in your, on your, in your state and your state's the hardest to hunt and all these things. Well, no, you actually could have shot the dominant mature buck in your area. You just passed him by because on social media, you see guys shooting 150s, 160s, 170s, Mm -hmm. but they're in a different state. Yep. There's totally different expectations right maybe your state is a lower population Mm -hmm. maybe the deer just don't get as big it's it's a different subspecies it's there's a lot of factors that that go into that so having a realistic expectation about your your state what it produces also is a big deal Mm -hmm. you know so it's instead of passing up that seven point that's seven years old <laughs> right you, you, you know what i mean yep. you shoot that set seven point mm-hmm. because he's seven years old yep. and then you're like i you're shooting mature deer yeah 
that's just what that deer looks like in your area. Yep. Just because he's not 160 does not make him any less yeah. of a mature buck yep. than, than, than these mm-hmm. other prime states. And mature buck is even a relative term because there's places in the country where three and a half, and we might have talked about this yeah. last time, a three and a half year old deer, that's a mature deer yep. in places. You look mm-hmm. at places in Michigan, mm-hmm. Pennsylvania, they get hunted really hard. They don't have a ton of deer. They don't have a ton of big deer. If you're killing a deer that's three and a half years old, that that might be a mature buck in your neighborhood. Yeah. If you're waiting around for a five and a half year old slob that mm-hmm. looks like something that we see here <laughs> in Iowa, easy, it, it ain't easy. gonna happen. <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah, and and it's just keeping relative. You know, keep yeah. keep your expectations realistic, and and then you know, just hunting it, Hunt, yep. hunting what you're given, and going from there. Yeah, and I think, and again, we might I might have said this last time you were on, but. In my opinion, if you're killing a deer that's a year older than what everybody else is killing, you're doing something right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. If everybody else is killing two-and-a-half-year-old deer, and you kill that three-and-a-half-year-old mm-hmm. deer, that's probably a mature deer for that area. Yep. You know, and like around here, a lot of people killing three-and-a-half-year-old deer. I think a four-and-a-half-year-old deer for where we're at, and mm-hmm. you can kill some five-and-a-halfs, no doubt, six-and-a-half-plus yep. here, but I think four-and-a-half is a pretty mature deer for where we're at. And yeah. now that, that continues to go up because at one time – not all that long ago, 20 years ago, three and a half was what yeah. guys were killing. Around. Yeah, yeah. Everybody was killing two and a half year old deer. Three and a half was looked at as a fairly mature deer. Yeah. Yeah. And we've seen that go up. It's just going to keep going up. But now when you go to southeast Iowa, five and a half, six and a half is a yeah. mature deer because everybody, I mean, people are killing four and a half year old deer, you know? So oh, yeah. I Absolutely. Think that's a, for me, that's a pretty good rule of thumb. It may not always work out that way, but if you're killing a deer, consistently killing deer that are a year older yeah. than what everybody else is killing. And you know you're doing something right and you're killing mature deer for your area. Yeah, and and don't mix up antler size with maturity. Mm-hmm. I hear it all, all the time, got guys saying that they don't have any mature deer in their state. Mm-hmm. They do. They just, they're just not 160s. So don't, don't mix up mature with antler size. Yep. We got to be very careful about about that because also hunting public land, a mature deer on public land because of stress, mm-hmm. he might not grow as big. Where yep. if that deer was on on pr- private with lower pressure, the lower stress will help him grow bigger antlers. Mm-hmm. Where he's a one thirty on public, he might have been a one fifty one sixty on private with lower stress. Yep. Stress goes into an- antler growth. Mm-hmm. So, um. Don't confuse antler size with mature bucks. Yep. No that, doubt. that is a difference. Yeah. We, I've seen plenty of 150 inch plus three and a half year old deer mm-hmm. killed around here and seen them while hunting, you know, not quite that big, but 130 inch deer that are 120 is two and a half year old. Yep. There's a lot of guys that shoot that deer because it has 120 inches of antler, mm-hmm. but. That's the kind of deer that if you give two or three more years, it's mega. Then you're looking at your Boone and Crockett deer. Yeah, you know, you're 160 yep. plus, mm-hmm. 170, 180. Yep. Kill the one that's five years old that's got 140 inches of antler, mm-hmm. and then let that one that's got 130, 150 at three and a half years old. Let him walk another year or two. Uh, then you're going to see those big deer that you're seeing on social media. But yeah, your expectations is you really have to manage those. And again, like you, even what you're talking about with your slam, you said if if you can kill four bucks, because if you can kill five in all five of those states, that would be, like you said, ridiculous. It would be awesome. But you know that the chances of that are a lot better that you kill four of them because you have the two states that you've hunted in a lot, you know, you and Kentucky you've hunted there, and then if you can get one other state, mm-hmm. you know. So managing your expectations is really important when it comes to having success as a hunter. Yeah. And if that's, if you want to kill a two and a half year old deer, by all means, go do it. But you can't have the expectation of, okay, I want to kill a 180, but then go kill every two and a half year old deer you see. Yeah. And, and like, and, and also from state to state this year with me, it's going to be change of expectation. Yeah. You know, where, where Candace, I'm holding out for a really big deer Mm -hmm. is because I have the ability to hunt it more. I have more intel gathered and it's just, it's my home state, so I can hunt yep. it more, right? I can put more time into it and let it produce. Um, Kentucky, I'm going to be realistic, but I'm going to keep my expectations up. 
because mm-hmm. I do have intel gathered. I know what's there. North Dakota, I'm I'm going to keep my expectation at about three and a half. Right. You know, you know what I mean? Because yep. I don't have any intel gathered. H- have I, you ever been there at all yet? None. At what, all. What do you know about it? Is there any trees there? I've heard that there's not any trees. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. So I've, I've got two properties I got my eye on. They're very different properties. One of them is more of a grassland, mm-hmm. but it has river bottoms and it has some thickets that look like some oak thickets. Another one is very steep, ridgy, nasty mm-hmm. property with fewer crop fields. So I haven't decided which one I'm, I'm hitting yet. Both look like they've got the potential of producing good deer. And and they're bigger properties, so it gives me a lot of options. But I just got to figure out which one I want to hit and then go, go from there. But, yeah, I'm going to keep my expectations of that lower just because I've got more than likely only be able to go up there once. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Where, where Kentucky, I might be able to come, in, come back twice, mm-hmm. right? Or Illinois, I'll make a couple hunts yeah. because it's not quite as far yeah. for, for me. So, so knowing that, I can keep my expectations up a little bit more for Kentucky and uh, Illinois and Mm -hmm. Missouri and Kansas just because I can hunt them just a little bit more, right? But with North Dakota, I got to keep them down to a realistic level. Mm -hmm. I still want a good deer. I'm not just going to shoot, you know, just just the the first thing that walks by, but Mm -hmm. I just got to fill out the property when I get there and then then go from there. Mm -hmm. So I've got one hunt. So I got one trip up there. Yeah. When I went out to Arizona, I had kind of in my mind what I wanted to shoot, especially like mule deer versus coos deer, because you can shoot both where I was mm-hmm. at. And I came across a couple of spike whitetails at, on maybe second to the last day. Yep. And had I not seen what was there the night before, like 120 inch coos deer, which is like a mega world class. Yeah. Yeah. I might have shot one of those. Yeah. And not that I'm completely upset that I didn't, but it's still, I think had I lowered my expectations a little bit, first time going out there, being that they are coos deer, they don't get very big anyway, Yeah. on pretty pressured public ground, I would have considered that a successful hunt now looking back, but at the time I was like, I'm just going to hold out, maybe I'll shoot something a little bigger, and then I end up eating tag soup, yep. like you said, which is fine, Yeah. but I think if you, like if you're, if you go to North Dakota, you've never been there before. And you're holding out for a five and a half year old deer, it the might, chances it, of you eating that tag are going way up, way up. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent way Instead up. Instead of yeah. just killing that three and a half year old deer, or like that spike in my situation, <laughs> right? Where I, had, I shot him, yeah. and I'd have been tickled to death with it, you know. Yeah, <laughs> and it'd have been a heck of a lot easier to pack <laughs> to the truck. <laughs> That's true. Very true. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, if and then you know, if it happens, it happens. If I shoot a five and a half year old deer up yeah. there, heck yeah, absolutely fantastic. It, but I'm not going to bank on it. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, we'll 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 just kind of fill it out and see see what happens. And yeah. Just keep good expectations. So, what's your scouting process look like? Is it because you can go? You're obviously going and getting all these properties. When you get on a property, well, I guess first of all, how much of it are you using maps for? We got into this a little bit last time, but I want to get into it a little mm-hmm. bit more in depth. You're using maps a little bit, maybe. And then you go and find what you want to look at. And then once you get to the property, are you just walking and trying to cover as much ground as possible, marking sign, and then coming back and going over everything? Or are you trying to make sense of it while you're out there walking it? Or is it a little bit of both? I mean, what's what's kind of your process for scouting? A little bit of both. I mean, I guess it does kind of depend on whether it's postseason or in season. Mm-hmm. Because postseason, I don't care about what I spook. I don't care about my intrusion. I'm just going to gather intel mm-hmm. because you can. The, you're not going to mess up your hunt right. at this t- time of year. So, um, I I look at maps a lot, and I get an idea of. You know, I look at pinch points, I look at funnels, I look at inside corners, what are possible crop fields and um, thickets, where possible what water is, and just kind of, kind of go from there. And then what I do is I'll, I, I'm not afraid of covering ground. I don't move slow. So I'll, I'll mark everything I see. And mm-hmm. then when I come to something that is exciting, I slow down mm-hmm. and I pick it apart. 
okay, what's the reason this is exciting? What What's going on here? And I might spend a little bit more time in that location and then move on. Mm-hmm. And then so I'm going to cover a lot of ground that doesn't mean anything. And I always want to get past it. And then I want to pay slow down and pay attention to what does matter. Mm-hmm. And then when I get to a, lo- a location and I haven't found anything yet, but I'm like, dude, there should be something here. Like what's okay. What What's going on? There should be something here. And that's where I'm going to slow down. And I'm like, okay, let's just, let's just kind of look around and then boom, I'll see a scrape or boom. I'll, I'll see a rub or a trail. And I'll mm-hmm. find that hidden movement. That's why it's called hidden movement. <laughs> right. Right. So, yep. so, so if I get to a location, it has, it has everything. It's difficult to get to. You've got your thickets, a lot of underbrush. There's producing oak trees. It's a sweet spot. And you're like, there should be deer here. And either a, they're not there. And if they're not there, that means they're getting hunted mm-hmm. and you just need to leave that location. Mm-hmm. But sometimes they are there, and you just have to find that hidden pattern. And then once you find that hidden pattern, it opens up your eyes to how they're using that ridge. And if you can figure out how they're using that that particular ridge, it might help you figure out how they're using the property in general. Yeah. So so you're going to piece together how they prefer using each location, and then there's going to be patterns to that. And then you can take that pattern – and similarity, and then put it to everything else you're finding as you walk the rest of that property. Mm-hmm. As you, once you get to a spot, okay, I know the deer were using this in this manner, so I'm just going to go over there and check that out and see if it's there. If it's not there, that means there's probably pressure, and I'll leave. If it's there, perfect. I'm going to mark everything, mm-hmm. and then that's when you start piecing together the pattern. Okay, I got to figure that's probably. You like finding that hidden sign. Yes. Because you got to figure most other people are not. Mm-hmm. So you know there's deer there. It's not obvious. Mm-hmm. They're probably not being hunted that much. And and the th- thing, though, is that they are, but mm-hmm. they're being hunted around. Okay? Right. right. So 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 there's no place on public we, we can go now that people aren't already. Right. Okay. Setups are getting lighter. People are mobile hunting. The knowledge is is. Is mm-hmm. bigger. I'm I'm running into guys with climbers four miles back on the property. I'm like, come on, dude, how can you haul that twenty pound thing? <laughs> yeah. Freaking four miles. Right. Like he's like soaked his sweat. I'm like, man, I feel bad for you, dude. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you want a saddle? <laughs> yeah, you but should check this out, dude. You should check easier. this out, dude. He's banging and clanging. Uh-huh. You know, the you hear him a hundred yards away <laughs> banging and clanging that stupid <laughs> the cl- climber up yeah. a tree. I'm yeah. like, crap, man. So, but but. The the deer know that they know those locations that they can escape and they can sense danger mm-hmm. from a distance, right? So that's where that hidden movement is going to be. That's where my responsibility is to find that hit, hidden movement because mm-hmm. they have figured out how to survive, and it's honestly not that far from pressure. The guys just aren't hunting the right spots, right? Or they're just off of it. They, they could be a hundred yards away and completely miss this location and never see this buck and he's just skirting them Mm -hmm. you you know what i mean but i would be there so you think that happens often a lot yeah a lot a lot more than those guys realize 100 percent. and and that that was something that um over the past five years or so what's really got me on big deer is i've gotten out of my own way i quit thinking that i'm going to find locations that people are not because it's not possible right these deer are actually closer to people than you think they have to be they're paying attention to them yeah that they, they are paying attention to the hunting pressure mm-hmm. and that and they are betting as close to the hunting pressure kind of as possible because the hunting pressure is in their crop fields right or, or mm-hmm. their oak flats and that areas that they're using so that they want to be close to those areas that they're using but they want to be safe at the same time so that they're betting in a manner that if if a guy walks that field edge, boom, they're gone. Or if they walk this point or this saddle, boom, they're gone, mm-hmm. right? So um, they have just figured out how to get around the movement. And a lot, lot of times there's going to be this this movement pattern that's in between hunting pressures. Mm-hmm. And it could be a tiny little, little hole, tiny little spot. They have just learned that, they can stay there because mm-hmm. people don't 
stay there. They're hunting around it, you know, a couple hundred yards away, but they're not hunting this particular location. Mm-hmm. You, you know what I mean? Yep. And that's where you just kind of have to keep an open mind and let the deer kind of tell you what they're doing and how that they're feeling. And um, don't overlook minimal sign. Because mm-hmm. sometimes that, like we go back go back to what we were talking about, that sometimes that minimal sign is their giveaway. Mm-hmm. That's their tell. So, you know, that you're, you're playing a, a poker hand. You're looking for the smallest tell, right? That's what I'm lo- looking for. I'm looking for the smallest tell that he is exposing himself in a manner that maybe somebody else is not picking up. Right. Yeah, that, that's all stuff, too, that translates to private property. I think one of the first things you should do, because we uh, this is another thing we talked about the other day, mm-hmm. is being a habitat manager versus a wildlife or deer manager. Mm-hmm. You can go make all the habitat improvements you want. If the deer don't want to use it, you just all you've done is cut down trees or, yeah. or work some dirt and put seed in the ground. Mm-hmm. I think you can use all these things you're talking about scouting, mm-hmm. finding the sign, the important sign and all that, finding how they're using the property, and then build your management plan based off of what the deer already want to do. Because you can only pull them so far. Yeah. You know, you can only make them do so much that you want them to do. Mm-hmm. Find out how they want to use it anyway, and then manipulate that to make it easier to hunt. 100%. Instead of just... Hey, I saw some guy hinge cutting trees on Facebook. <laughs> yeah. I saw some guy light his field on fire, so I'm going to burn my whole 160 acres. Right. Yeah. You know, it looked awesome for two hours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Instead of just doing that blindly, you can, impl- uh, you can use, implement what you're talking about, mm-hmm. these scouting strategies like you would on public land. Yep. But then instead of just having to find the best way in to go hunt that deer now, where you have the benefit of owning property or being able to do you something create to create it. it is you can you can take that information and make it even more use it even mm-hmm. more to your advantage. Yep. Yeah. And and that that's what I um I tell my my clients is you, you know you're not going to make him do anything that he doesn't feel safe doing. No mm-hmm. I don't care how sweet of a food plot you got. Mm-hmm. If he doesn't feel safe using it, he's not going to use it. Nope. Mm-hmm. So so you know we get into this frame of mind. I think a lot, a lot of guys try to sell this too. Is is creating this perfect property that will force deer to use it mm-hmm. in this manner? Mm-hmm. Well, you can only do that to a certain extent, right? Right. If he doesn't feel safe doing it, he's not going to do it. Mm-hmm. No matter how sweet of a property you've got, if if you're not hunting it correctly, and and maybe you're gonna it's end ma- up ma- with a bunch of really wired does yeah. <laughs> using the property all the time. Yeah, exactly, right? Exactly. And and just just sweeten up what he's already doing. Sweeten up what the deer are already doing. They're telling you where they feel safe. Mm-hmm. They're telling you what, where their movement patterns are. So if you would just sweeten that pot a l- little bit, you know, set up your management plan according to what the deer are already doing, mm-hmm. that'll only increase what they're already do, doing exactly and and encourage them to do it more often mm-hmm. and during the day so so that's really what what we're after we're not trying to create this whole new property to force deer onto it we're just trying to keep them there longer yeah and keep them there during the day longer mm-hmm. and that's what we're trying to do yeah yeah and that's even even using that scouting you might open up more of your property to hunt that you didn't know you could hunt yeah. before and yeah. using the not only the public land scouting ideas but the way you hunt public land if there's parts of your property where the north farm up there is similar to this because i can't do anything with it mm-hmm. if there or if there's a place like that a permission property if you can scout it like you would public ground and go hunt it with a similar attitude to hunting public ground you're already ahead of the curve because no one else should be there yep at least there's not going to be as many people there as there would be on public. <laughs> you might you might unlock parts of that property that now you can go hunt that you didn't think you could before. Mm-hmm. Maybe that's where that buck's hanging out. And and I'll see that that a lot too because you'll ru- you'll run into stands that have been there for ten to twenty years and mm-hmm. they've hunted that religiously. Mm-hmm. Well, this trail you can see the shift in the trail. The tra- the trail has shifted 
around this tree stand. Mm -hmm. And and all of the movement is set up in a ma manner that they can sit back there and they can wind that tree stand before they walk out into that field. Mm -hmm. So that they, they know that tree stands there. It's been there forever. They either completely bypass it and go around it. I've seen that. that That's really crazy where the trail is going straight. Mm -hmm. And the closer it gets to the stand, it diverts. <laughs> yep. It goes around. And then it connects back to where it was. Right. It's really interesting. They know. Yep. And um, um, and that's part of the trick with what I'm doing on public is you got to be unpredictable. Mm -hmm. And and the more they they know you're there, they're gonna adjust their patterns accordingly. Exactly. And they're not gonna. So if you were to hunt your private property, rather than hunting this one stand that's been there for twenty years, and every five to seven years you'll shoot a big buck out of it. Mm -hmm. Right, so that that that's the case. You'll shoot well, every five to seven years. You'll shoot a big buck out of it, and it'll keep you in that stand and thinking it's a good stand. When well, actually, if you were just to bounce back here, you could shoot them every year. Mm -hmm. you, you shoot a buck a year yep. versus a buck every five to seven. Yeah. So that also goes back to I mean, a lot of guys don't have as much time to do that, you know. Right. And I'm not going to knock that that at all. Get out and hunt that stand. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? If that's all you got is that opening weekend. Go out and hunt that stand. Right. You, you know what I mean? But if you want to put more time into it, know that there's other options, and there's a big chance that they probably know that you're hunting that stand yep. before you, when you get it, yep. get into it. So We do become creatures of habit, too, and it's important to stay flexible. Mm -hmm. But there are situations, too, where you can get away with that. Like I was yep. telling you there at the cabin the other day, I don't know how many 140-plus deer that I've either had the chance to or shot out of that one stand – but it's because they don't know I'm hunting them. Yeah. If you can, it, if you're hunting that same stand that's been there for 10, 15 years and you've been busted out of it twice every year, mm -hmm. they're going to figure it out. That's where you yep. get those trails that go around it. If they don't know you're hunting them, if you've, I've, the only time I've ever been seen out of that stand was the time I told you the arrow fell off. Mm -hmm. And I'm not even sure he knew what he was looking at. <laughs> he just heard it. He and probably looked thought up a there. stick was fall falling exactly. through the tree or something. He looked up there, yeah. and then he took off. Because yeah. something just wasn't right. Something wasn't That's right. the closest I've ever been to being busted in that tree mm -hmm. in close to 15 years yeah. now. So if you're going to do that, because there are places on certain private property where the deer are just going to use it. That's yeah, where It's 100%. the right spot to yep. be. Mm -hmm. You cannot let the deer know you're hunting them. And that, that's where it comes back to your um, how often you hunt it mm -hmm. and being very, very smart and precise yeah. with how you hunt it Be, because that, that's a very good point. You could have a tree stand in the same tree for 15 years, and it mm -hmm. produces every year. Mm -hmm. But if you were just to hunt it, just to hunt it, right. they won't use it. So if you're extremely precise with your hunting and you're smart about how you approach that, mm -hmm. yes, you will have success yep. out of that same tree because – the deer just prefer that yep. location. And they don't know you're there. And they don't know you're there. Exactly. So it really depends on your setup at that point. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I think that comes down to it a lot. One thing I was going to back up on, you were talking about uh, the public ground and how the deer are stressed out and where they feel pressure and where they use different places. It's interesting that on public ground, like a deer's number one predator is people. Mm -hmm. So you have to account for that. Mm -hmm. On private ground, a lot of times... Their number one predator, again, if you're hunting smart and stuff, coyotes, maybe bobcats to an extent for fawns and stuff like that. But it's going to be, it's a completely different world mm -hmm. of what those deer are dealing with and why they're going to do certain things. So I think when you're hunting public land, that's one place where it, it for sure differs is you got to take into account the kind of predation that they're dealing with. Yep. Because their number one goal is to survive. Yeah. Whether that be to not get eaten by a coyote or not get shot by some redneck in a red flannel <laughs> with <laughs> smoking a cigar. Yeah. They're trying to survive, you yeah. know. So you have to take that into account. And on public land, that's just so much different. Yeah. And be, because you take the natural predators, the natural predators are still there. Exactly. On, on public. But then you add the increase in y your human predation. Mm -hmm. and, and, yeah, it does. The deer have a lot more to think about. Yeah, and it I, it definitely changes the way they move and stuff. And it, it does. And there was you were talking about where you can find that hidden sign, and they're being hunted all around. It's almost like uh, the public land hunters have their core area, like the bucks do, mm -hmm. and you kind of see these big circles where they hunt. And mm -hmm. it sounds to me like if you can find the area where those don't intersect, yep, and there's not people in there, then that might be that little narrow corridor that they have to either stay in or move through. 
and that's what I'm looking for. Mm-hmm. And that that's exactly what the property I was on th- this weekend, when we hunted it two years ago, I figured that out very fast. Mm-hmm. Where the overlap was and where the two main bubbles of pressure were coming from mm-hmm. in each direction. And then I found the middle ground, and that's where the deer were. So this year I just went straight there. Mm-hmm. I just went straight to that mid- middle ground, and that's where I set the – the cameras knowing that the deer are moving in this ma- manner because of the pressure i was able to take that around the property you know, you know what i mean mm-hmm. and, and use it that same manner knowing the pressure is going to come from this direction and this direction but there's going to be this one spot mm-hmm. maybe that they're not getting to you know, or as or getting to as often that that's that's a better point get not getting to as right. often right and um and that's where the deer are going to be so that that's once you find that once I found that pattern, I was able to implement that better throughout the property. Mm-hmm. So yeah, if you can find find where they don't overlap and you got a little bit of a gap in those pressure bubbles, then there's a good chance that's where you find that hidden movement. Yeah, for sure. Well, we'll get you out of here on the road, but before we do, I gotta ask. Uh, you've hunted obviously several different states, killed mature nice bucks in different states, and. It's all on, I mean, a lot of it's on YouTube, so mm-hmm. if anybody's listening, go check it out for sure. But what has been your favorite state to hunt, and maybe your, if it's if it's not the same, what was your favorite hunt that you've had so far? Oh, man. At least a, since, at least since starting to film. Starting to film. Okay, that's a good, that's a good one. So, probably my favorite hunt is pr- my Iowa hunt. Mm-hmm. So, and the big reason is because of the adventure side of it. That that was a canoe hunt. So, it was yeah. a five-day. I camped a mile from the truck. I didn't see my truck for five days. <laughs> yeah. It was, you know, it's it's all set self-filmed. I canoed back and forth a mile and a half for five days to, from camp to where I was hunting. Mm-hmm. And that, that was such a fun hunt. The adventure of that was just amazing. I saw a lot of deer, saw two shoot shooters, and one of them ended up in the canoe. Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> you're camping in a tent. Yep, in, in in a little backpacking and using, tent and using a canoe. Yep, you were like a real Indian. Yep, <laughs> <laughs> man. Yep, and and then you, you know that same year um, that this was I'm I'm talking on 21 here um, because 21 was a huge filming season for for me. Mm-hmm. Um, you know the seven days before that I had my um, Missouri hunt which the bucks were fighting right under my tree stand. Mm-hmm. That that was an insane experience. And then, then you've got a month later my when I shot my 170. I shot my 170 in an hour and a half before that. Mm-hmm. I saw a 190. Yeah. Non-typical. And it's all on film. So if you think I'm BS and you go watch it. <laughs> <Yeah. So laughs> right. It's, it's, it's on film. You got the proof. Yeah. yeah, I got the proof. So so like the Iowa hunt, though, the the adventure behind it was was a blast. Mm-hmm. And it, you know, it was this ultra mature 130-inch eight point. Yeah. So I mean it was it was a, such a fun hunt and then and then a month later I had the experience of seeing two megas in one hunt two two of the biggest deer I've ever seen on stand mm-hmm. and one of them ended up in the truck right so both on film yeah, <laughs> yeah that was pretty crazy <laughs> yep you got anything else for him man I don't think so that's uh, you're doing some pretty hardcore stuff you really are <laughs> yeah. appreciate it. I'm looking forward to watching it all this fall and getting back with you and maybe doing some hunting together at some point, too. That sounds good to me, man. Absolutely. I mean, we already have uh, Illinois hunting licenses. So right. Maybe when you hit it, go come yeah. over this way, we can do some hunting. <laughs> yeah, We're prepared. I, yes. <laughs> I was going to say, I think it's um, June 1st I can buy that tag, I think, right? Is it? I think. I'm not it, sure I'll, on that. I'll have to look at it again, but yeah. I think. Uh, over-the-counter archery sales? Yeah. I think it is. Is uh, it June right. 1st? Yeah. And go. I think he it's knows. a, is it a quota, I think? Like far as only I know, only X net number of tags get sold. As far as I know, there's not Man, a number there's on not. it. Nah, okay. Illinois politicians For archery. will take anybody's money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. As far as I know, now we've been wrong on here before. That's true. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> that's true. But, but yeah, I I would say uh, grab it sooner rather than later. I was, that, that's yeah. what I was thinking. Is like I'm gonna go ahead and grab it. That way, it's in my pocket and I don't yeah. have to worry about it. Yep. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. But no, definitely looking forward to it. Tactical Approach Outdoors, pretty much everywhere. Yes, sir. Right? That's the YouTube channel. YouTube. And Instagram, Facebook. TikTok. Uh, TikTok. And my website is tacticalapproachoutdoors.com. Tactical Approach Outdoors. Okay, yep. cool. Absolutely. And you've got some 
courses coming up. Like you've got one in Kansas coming up, correct? Yeah, I, I have a, a workshop, a whitetail workshop coming up in uh, Father's Day weekend in Lacine, okay. Kansas. So anybody in the area that's interested, and that's going to be mobile hunting forward. We're going to talk scouting, um, going to get the saddles out. We're going to go over how to hunt out of a sat saddle mm -hmm. and um, really create a cool um, learning environment with a group of like-minded yeah. hunters. And yeah. it's just, it's going to be a really fun day, and it's going to we're just going to spend all day and get a little, little bit of time in the woods and a lot of time um, talking, answering questions, and going over over the the uh, material. Cool, man! I really like everything you're doing, and I hope you have. I hope you kill five bucks this fall, man. Well, I, I appreciate it. Man. <laughs> I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, but we'll get you out of here, get you back on the road. Really appreciate you stopping by, though, on your way through. Absolutely. Thanks for having me by. I love talking to you guys. So anytime you want to chat, I'm always game for talking deer. For sure, man. And we'll get you back in here one of these days, too. We'll be back in the area. So, all right, man. Thanks. Absolutely.